to introduce our speaker and I thank David Porger, the chair of the Italian department because this is a department organized by the, an event organized by the department. But I asked explicitly to David if I could introduce Ezekiel Mubaransky because I had the fortune of being a student during the first semester in which he taught in the United States at the University of Virginia. And um, you're in for a treat, even if uh, I have to say that sitting in a, in a room with Zig for a semester, only one other student talking about Dante was a privilege, a pleasure, and uh, that Felicità Mentale, the uh, famous Dante scholar, uh, used as the title of his book, uh, became concrete, apparent, and delivered on a weekly basis during his Dante seminar. He asked me to uh, be very short, so I'm not going to read the titles of his book. But if I have to pinpoint... I actually don't write books, let's begin with that. I've never <laughs> written a book in my life. So. Articles that Denner put together and collected as books. Of his scholarship would be what we were mentioning yesterday, that his ability or furbizia in finding the blind spot of Dante's studies. One would think that everything is a, has already been written about Dante. If you go to the library, you're overwhelmed. Uh, by the number of books, including very weird books about Dante. <laughs> there is a whole uh, convenio that uh, Umberto Eco organized, was called the Lato Oscuro, of all the crazy esoteric interpretations of Dante and much more. But there are blind spots. And what Zig has been able to do over the course of his career was to find those out, the, the sort of unexplored, uncharted, unmapped territory in the field of Dante studies. And that's where he came in, and he was able to shed new light on, um, on Dante studies. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce him to you, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, his talk and will participate in the discussion that we follow. Please welcome Zip. We've always had some great uh, not only from free watches. Uh, um, thank you, Stefano, and thank you, David. How can you have a watch like this? Come on, film the watch. This is the worst watch you've ever seen, you know. <laughs> I don't wear watches amongst my many eccentricities. So, all right, he said to talk for about 45 minutes, so I need a watch to help me regulate myself, because once I start speaking, unfortunately, I'm a bit like those toys that you wind them up and they keep going and going and going. So, uh, I just want to begin with a few caveats. I, I, I'm going to be relatively critical about the way in which Dante studies have approached the kind of problems that I'm going to be addressing today. Blind spots is a rather nice way of putting it. And yes, I've been lucky that I been able to ask questions about really often very banal things, but which, strangely, Dante scholarship, despite that, you know, verminaio di glossatori, as Marinetti termed it over a hundred years ago, you know, that the scholarship has just evaded. You know, to give you a very banal example, I ask myself, why is a canto called a canto? Nobody in several hundred years of Dante scholarship had ever posed really what's a very banal question because we all assumed that, you know, we all know what a canto is. But in fact, it was highly problematic. The term canto did, was not meant to be used as to define a division within an epic poem. In fact, it wasn't, you know, it was a generic term, song. So it was really, you know, it's asking these sorts of questions that really I've built for what, you know, if one may term it, my career as a scholar. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is, is please don't think that I somehow feel that 
I'm the cleverest person around, or that all my colleagues are fools, or etc. No, quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, I'm very grateful that I work in a field which is so intellectually rich and where there is, you know, such an interest also beyond Italian with contributions coming from all sorts of other disciplines. I've often felt that, you know, one of the reasons that Italian studies is able to survive, that certainly one of those reasons is because there was a poet several hundred years ago called Dante Alighieri who you know, now more than Petrarch has drawn the attention of scholars in other disciplines. But there's also true that my approach has largely been historicist in character. I'm interested in what one might call kind of cultural archaeology. I try to understand what within my limits and the limit and I you know, I'm not someone, as some of our colleagues in Italy, who feel that philology is a kind of pure discipline that they can reconstruct some sort of truth about the past. I don't believe that. I, I accept all the mediations and all the, you know, the impossibility, really, of any sort of truthful, in inverted commas, engagement with the past. For me, being, you know, being concerned with the past, being concerned with how late medieval culture in central Italy may have functioned and how that culture may have affected the way in which Dante dealt with certain issues, the, wrote a certain type of poetry or other types of texts. That's one side, but I also believe that historicists are also historians of their discipline. So I've always been very much engaged with what other scholars have written about about Dante and about related issues. And I think that's helped me to pick up on the blind spots. Those of you who may have read some of my work, you will, of course, you know, appreciate how that my footnotes are neurotic. They're the, the, they're the footnotes of an obsessive, in that I, you know, I try to read in inverted commas everything, which is, of course, an impossibility you know, in any field, and particularly so in Dante. I don't believe, as some colleagues do, that everything has already been said by Dante, we just haven't read it. I believe that, you know, that if one engages with the critical tradition, one, all sorts of, you know, interesting possibilities emerge. Now, the work that I'm going to talk to you a bit about today, which is, you know, the visio dei, I'm bringing God to you, you know, uh, the problem of the beatific vision, which was an enormous problem in medieval culture. It was, uh, everyone agreed that that was a reward that would be given to those who had led, you know, a morally upright life. But amongst, you know, both at the highest levels in the universities, amongst, you know, the scholastic theologians, right down into popular culture, and how one can reconstruct popular culture for the Middle Ages is another very interesting set of problems which I won't really have time to go into today, was what exactly it entailed was hugely problematic. It was a matter of dispute. And since it was a matter of dispute, this raises all sorts of questions regarding the way in which Dante may, and I, sim and I do stress may, have addressed it in the Commedia, but also elsewhere. I'm only going to focus on the Commedia, and in particular I'm just going to focus on the last ten lines of the poem, although I'll be making reference to other parts of the Commedia itself. That this particular issue is really part of a much larger project that I've been working on for over 25 years, and it really began from a very banal question, one of those blind spots. I asked myself, I'd been asked to give the lecture that is given in the Ravenna every year to mark the, the, the poet's death, and I asked a very simple question, where did Dante go to school? And really, no, but all sorts of assumptions had been made about Dante's education, which were really, when, once one began to sort of probe into that particular Set of, set of issues, you discovered that really we, all, we know nothing about 
that is education. Partly because we know almost nothing about the schools in Florence at the end of the 13th century. And I suddenly thought, well, this is interesting, isn't it? We make all sorts of hypotheses, make all sorts of assumptions about Dante. You know, until relatively recently, Dante was, to use that French phrase, celui qui a lu tous les livres. What, you know, the mio piccolo, as they say in Italian, and I mean that quite seriously, is I began to question that. I began to question this idea that Dante was someone who had this extraordinary access to books. And what we've been working on, myself and others, not just my students, but both in the UK and even in Italy now and North America, is really... What we need to know and understand, and there are some of you here who, you know, have been more, have been, you know, in part involved in the kind of work that I and others have been doing, it's, it's really to ask ourselves, what was the cultural environment like in Florence in the second half of the 13th century, and in particular approximately from 1280 to 1301? And one of the things that has emerged is that really Florence is relative, in relative terms, is an intellectual backwater at this time. All of us think that Florence is this extraordinary intellectual cultural center, which of course it will become, and we kind of, you know, sort of cast backwards from that image that we all have of this great center that is Renaissance Florence onto the Florence where Dante grew up. Just to give you a, a very banal example, Arezzo was more a more vibrant cultural center at the time, not in part because it had an in a university, than Florence. And actually, when we start trying to understand how books circulated in Florence, how knowledge circulated in Florence, we really come up with very little, which in itself is, is interesting, but we also come up that really this is a place, for instance, where classical culture has been largely marginalized. Florence was, from what we understand, was a, prof a center for professional education. Most of the secondary level schools <coughs> were to train people in things like accountancy or the equivalent of accountancy, or preparing people to then go to, let's say, the University of Bologna so that they could become um, to go notaries. It was a, you know, it's a bit like the modern university nowadays there, that we've got this high level of professionalization. There's no evidence at all that Dante, we know Dante learned to read, and I know sometimes the very banal things can be extremely helpful. Dante, of course, learned to read and write, and he learned to read and write Latin at quite a high level. He couldn't have written the epistles that he did, or would have been or actually had been tasked to write those epistles in the early years of his exile, if it hadn't been recognized that he had a degree of proficiency in Latin. He couldn't have written the De Vulgari Eloquentia at around 1304-1305 without a high degree of Latin. But where did he learn that Latin? What sort of text? One of my students, Filippo Gianferrari, who's been teaching at Vassa recently and is now about to go to Smith, he has tried to see the extent to which there is evidence of school textbooks in Dante's writing. It's extraordinary that no one before Filippo, who finished his PhD a year ago, actually approached that. The so-called auctores minores, the minor authors, who are of course distinct from the major authors, who are the great Latin epic poets, the, you know, Virgil and Ovid, etc. Most of the evidence now would suggest that Dante, before his exile, had not read Virgil. We can map this in the text themselves. And that's one way of looking at what Dante may or may not have known, is by actually going to what he wrote at different points in his life, which can allow us to plot. And I'll, if any of you are coming to the workshop on the convivio. Tomorrow I'll be talking a little bit about precisely this question of when did, may Dante have had access to the major authors and to classical culture in general. If you think about Dante before the exile, 
How many references to classical culture are there in the Rime and in the Vita Nova? If chapter 25, which is a completely eccentric chapter, or chapter whatever it is, 16 in the Gorni numbering, if that chapter didn't exist in the Vita Nova, the overt classical references are barely noticeable. And you have this totally eccentric chapter which seems to come from completely from left field because there is no preparation in the Vita Nova prior to that that this is a work that is engaging with classical culture. And there's a whole set of problems related to that chapter precisely in terms of why does he quote, nobody had really studied, why does he quote those particular passages from the classics that he actually quotes in that chapter. Again, these are these little blind spots within the tradition. As part of this, one of the things I've become really, and it's very odd because my name is Zygmunt <coughs> Guido Barański. My parents were, one was a Polish, the other one was Italian. What was, you know, I was screwed. I got baptized, I got sent to Catholic school, etc. And at a certain <coughs> point in my teenage years, I, I didn't, you know, I stopped believing. But I am culturally a Catholic. I can't, you know, I went to a Catholic grammar school, I got, and I spent a lot, as a medievalist, it's extremely difficult not to be dealing with Christian culture at a very sophisticated level. And to presume otherwise, to presume somehow that even the most secular of, of people living in, let's say, at the end of the 13th century, could somehow evade the influence of Christianity. It's just a nonsense that you can somehow create a Middle Ages that is exclusively secular. I, you know, Pasolini, many centuries later on, got it right when he said that everybody in Italy was both Catholic and, you know, and communist, regardless of, you know, and it's simply the kind of, it's around you, it's part of the culture within which you're, you know, within which you think, live, feel, etc. And I've been, as we know, post you know, because Dante was so heavily involved in the unification process, Dante became secularized because we know the way in which Italy is unified, or at least part of it, is in opposition to the papacy, it's in opposition to Catholicism, etc. And this seculariz secularization of Dante, especially in Italy, has had a very negative impact, in my view, in my humble opinion, upon the way in which Dante scholarship has developed. Because it's really ignored what is the most striking feature of <coughs> what this guy wrote and what this guy thought, is that he was engaging at, in all of his texts, there is no text where he doesn't do this, with the religious culture of his state. To put it in very simple terms, the Divine Comedy, which is not the title of the poem, as we know, because it was Comedia, but the very fact that that epithet became attached to it so, so you know, almost immediately, although it wasn't actually applied to the poem itself, but Dante was presented as the Divine Poet. The epithet Divine was only attached in 1555 in one of the, the, the Venetian editions, if I'm not mistaken is that he is a great religious poet, arguably the greatest religious poet of the Western tradition. And yet, it's actually been a struggle until relatively recently, and someone like Susanna sitting there knows who's worked on angelology and on, on other related issues, is that there are still colleagues in Italy who deny that there is a religious dimension to Dante. And this is a work that deals with salvation. It deals with a journey to God. Someone that both David and I know, who John Woodhouse, who was my teacher and then was professor at, had the, the Serena chair at, at uh, Oxford. He and I, when I was an undergraduate already then, would have arguments because for him it was simply a political work. There are colleagues in Italy who may not want to see the Commedia as a political work, but they see it essentially as a text that is exclusively dialoguing with other poets. So they kind of, and yet the most frequent and the richest intertext in the Commedia and in all of Dante's works, all of Dante's works, is the Bible. You can document that. It's not something to discuss. You just, it's simply a fact. But yet, despite that, there's been this secularization. 
And what I've tried to do is it's say, look, it's not an issue. We have to treat Dante, you know, in his own terms and understand the why of this engagement with the religious culture, which also raises the question, where does Dante's religious culture come from? Because there wasn't a single religious culture. There were the tenets of the faith, which most people said, you don't touch those, you accept those. And there is, <laughs> and I'm a great believer that Dante, however close he may get to what, what might be termed an orthodoxy, he always stays this line. But he, he certainly, he works within what the religious culture allows him to do, the possibilities offered within the fact that this is a culture that is full of debates, it's full of antagonisms. There's possibility that even people lost their jobs in universities because of particular interpretations they offered. But in fact, in general, it was a very tolerant environment. The idea that in the Middle Ages, if you held a problematic view, you were immediately burnt at the stake or put into a dungeon, is really nonsense. Um, this is not to say that heretics whatever, you know, heretics in medieval terms meant simply someone who persisted in an unorthodox interpretation of scripture after she or he, normally he, knew that that was an error. It was a, a sin of obstinacy, of <laughs> persisting in holding an erroneous view when you actually had been informed that that view was erroneous. In general, we know because we, the documentary evidence exists and there have been some remarkable the interesting books written in the last 10 to 15 years, precisely on what we might call, the term didn't exist, and they wouldn't have understood this notion of intellectual freedom, but, you know, to be anachronistic, is the fact that people had a lot of room to maneuver, especially in intellectual circles. And as Augustine himself said, you know, he said, you know, Moses wrote it about Genesis and then he went away, which meant that then there was huge room for everybody to interpret and that it could be no single interpretation because that way would be a banalization of the Word of God because the Word of God by its very nature would be something that transcended any possibility of understanding and meaning that, hum that any human person or even humanity altogether might be able to achieve an appropriate. So, What's happened if we move into the area of religious culture is that people, yes, in general there's been a recognition, but they've all said theology, you know, and somehow they've used this term theology to really, again, to kind of dismiss the importance of the religion. The religious is not the same as the theological. Christianity is not the same as theological. Theology was a battlefield. At the end of the 13th century, there were competing views as to what theology was. There was no one standard view. And again, it's one of those things. Dante never uses the term theology in the Commedia, which is already interesting. Why does he avoid this term? <laughs> and it may be in part that because what he's trying to do in the Commedia is the heaven of the sun offers as a kind of key model is he's trying to, you know, create an idea of harmony, of syncretism, of synthesis, etc. Of actually reconciling difference, reconciling, you know, the sort of petty human arguments, to put it as banally as that, and to actually recognize that the notion of truth is much more complex. Just by the way, where is the book on truth in Dante? Yeah, another very strange thing that why, in fact, where is the book on Dante and God, or the treat, the representation of God or Christ, or the Trinity? We don't often we miss these extremely obvious, you know, topics. So if anyone's a Dantist and is looking for a top, you know, subject, I can give you about a hundred. You know, I can just uh, and there's I've just given you three or four, but there's, there's so many interesting areas which have just been ignored. And what's happened, in fact, is that what interests me, and I've got some students working on this now as well, is the fact that theology itself is common. And Dante had, what, Dante, what theology was for Dante, it was two things. One, it was exegesis. It meant interpreting the Bible. Because when he talks about theology in the convivio, that's how he uses the term. Very clearly, 
placing himself in opposition to what one might term more scientific and in inverted commas notions of theology that were coming from the Dominicans in particular, <laughs> but from the universities in Paris and Bologna and even Oxford. You know, but the influences on Dante are probably Bologna and, and possibly, you know, the others as well. But that what and, and the fact for him theology was revelation. Is that there is a knowledge that can be granted to us that is given to us by God through divine illumination. Dante believed in this. And so it was a, a knowledge that isn't somehow rationally he's got he's not this doesn't mean that he didn't appreciate and actually celebrate the potential of human reason, which he saw as a gift from God, but the potential of human reason to actually have all sorts of interesting insights, but that by very definition, because they are something that comes from us and all of our limitations, they are limited or they can only achieve a degree of authority, a degree of veracity within certain restricted sort of areas of human experience, of human intellectual experience. So what really the... And, some of this comes from, in the area of English, uh, and even in French, there's a lot more work that's being done on the way in which, <laughs> let's say, a popular piety, a much broader notion of religiosity, and I use the term without any negative connotation, of religious feeling, and how these religious feelings could be stimulating, included textually. Which brings us into the, the way in which in from post the Lateran, the fourth Lateran Council in 1215, there's a much greater attempt within Christian culture, within the institution of Christianity, to bring in the faithful, majority of whom, of course, are illiterate. So how do you know? So there's a much greater way of trying to emotively, emotionally, effectively bring in people. And the Commedia, if it's a text that deals with salvation, as does also the Vita Nova, and one of the things that's happening with the, the Vita Nova is that people see it much less as an elite <laughs> work than they used to in the past. People are now beginning to recognize that there's a discourse within the Vita Nova which is not simply addressed to you know, gentle ladies and people of noble heart, which was the standard view, that there's in fact a, a dimension of the Vita Nova which is an address at least rhetorically, whether it's like, you know, to the average Christian, the semplice, in the, you know, with the positive notions of simplicity that it has within the Christian tradition. But if we're in a, if we find ourselves at a cultural moment where there is an attempt to bring the faithful in, to engage the faithful within the institution of Christianity, the Commedia, in very general, that's what the Commedia is trying to do. It's a text that at one level is speaking to everyone because salvation is accessible to everybody. So how does it do it? How does the, you know, how might we relate the Commedia to these forms of, let's call it popular piety, but, you know, in a broad sense? And this again is an area on which there's a huge amount to be done. So, for instance, I've got a, one student who's looking at sort of the penitential tradition, which was one area where precisely the church wanted to attempt to ex exercise a degree of control of the faithful and of also of involving the faithful within certain rituals. And, that, and we all know how vital penance is, repentance is, confession is, at all sorts of level, especially in the Purgatorio, but not only, within the poem itself. So, th there's a whole area to be done in there. And it's, I've only got like 20 minutes left, and I haven't even touched the, the Pazienza, who cares? You've got a nice handout, you can, you know. <laughs> we may even talk about that, you know, but... but it's a bit like, you never know with me what you're going to get, you know, unfortunately. It's sort of, and the older I get, the more eccentric I get it. And I apologise for that, you know. So, let's talk a little bit about the, the beatific vision. 
The beatific vision, as I mentioned, was a major problem at the time. It was an issue of considerable debate, and why? Those of you who know your Bible, or who've read up in <coughs> preparation for this talk of mine, you know, about sort of medieval ideas on the beatific vision. Sorry. Don't worry about it, you know. Right. <laughs> It may be Dante trying to get through, saying, you know, I'm a kick at the Spidey Chen, though, you know. <laughs> Is that in the New and the Old Testament, there's a contradiction. There are statements which say very explicitly the beatific vision is possible, and there are other statements that say precisely the opposite. It is not possible to see and know God. So you've already got a major problem there, just for how you're going to reconcile. And of course, those of you who may work on scriptural hermeneutics, etc., know that a lot of effort by extremely bright people, Augustine is the you know, a great case in point, worked extremely hard in order to attempt to offer persuasive explanations for these contradictions that exist in the Bible. But there's also other issues, and this is where Dante scholarship has been, to a certain extent, remiss. Within the Dante scholarship, and I've got a long article on the Beatific Vision, which I fear all of you are going to have to read if you're interested, because I'm not going to be able to really go into details, even I've got tw less than 20 <laughs> minutes left now, uh, that... You know, in where I go through, very, it's actually a very long, boring, I, you know. One of the advantages, and perhaps David will agree with me in this, you know, one of the very few things that is a benefit of having reached a certain, you know, position in our profession is that I can publish things, however short or long I want. The idea that an article has to be 8,000 words or whatever it is. You know, I send something that's 3,000, they'll publish me. If I send something of 30,000, they'll grumble, but they'll publish me. That, that's probably, <laughs> this is one of those 28,000, 30,000 word articles, you know. So, uh, is that in Dante scholarship, they, they talk about the visio dei, they talk about beatitude in the singular. Wrong. And this becomes very important as to why the debate on the beatific vision in Dante has really not been very successfully explored. Because the basic premise has been a mistaken premise. <laughs> the assumption has been is that the kind of experience that Dante claims that the pilgrim has, they compare it to the standard literature on the beatific vision enjoyed by the blessed and by the angels. Unfortunately, it was a commonplace, this was one of the few things that everybody agreed on, was that there, in fact, there were two types of beatific vision. There was the beatific vision that one was able to have, was they termed in patria, i.e. when you've actually died and have gone up to heaven, and then there was the beatific vision that was possible in via, i.e. when you were still alive. So the very fact, if you're comparing, if you're trying to explain what the pilgrim's experience may have been, in light of what Dante himself says elsewhere in the text, never mind what the tradition says, of what the beatific vision was like in Patria, for, for the angels and for the blessed, you're already starting off on the wrong present. You're not quite comparing chalk and cheese, but you're certainly comparing two different types of experience. And this is actually a very important point to remember in any discussion of the beatific envision is that we're going that he's dealing with two different experiences, and the next other this, another area of control. The and sorry, and in life, very few people have had that privilege. If we take an example from the New Testament, it's Paul. That io non enea, io non Paolo sono relates to this, but the other great figure is Moses, and it's interesting. Again, if you want a PhD, someone else. Do it on Moses and Dante. Doesn't exist, should be done. <laughs> and remember that Moses is also a great writer. He is one of the great scriptural authors. And then we know how Dante compares his own achievements as a writer, you know, with those of the, the scriptural figures. <laughs> 
David, who only writes a teodia, whilst he writes a comedia, and the teodia is delimiting in there, or that he's able to say that John is with me, Giovanni e Merco, etc. Uh, compares himself already in the convivia to Solomon, you know, as if the two of them are, are on equal footing. This is long before he writes the commedia. The other area of controversy is one that is whether the attitude is achieved intellectually or whether it's achieved effectively. And this notion of affectivity, of emotion, of love, of satisfaction, of desire, is when I mentioned earlier about certain types of emotional religiosity, it's what also led me to examining the question of the Bizio Day. And your quotations four and five from Thomas and Bonaventure, I'm not suggesting that they are necessarily Dante sources, but they very well capture, and I give the translations in Italian because they're closer to the Latin, that's the reason why I do it. Uh, is very clear. Thomas very clearly says it's an intellectual experience and love affectivity follows on to that in a subordinate position, whilst what Bonaventure says is precisely the opposite. The intellect fails and then what you have is an affective experience. And that was the debate. To be fair to both of them, and, and Thomas is even clear on this, he's trying to move to a reconciliation. He's trying, you know, we sh it's very easy and, and scholarship has tended to do this, not just within Dante studies, but also within historians of ideas, etc., is to make the opposition too stark, Bonaventure versus Thomas, because we kind of like these sort of things, you know, intellective versus effective. It's a lot more complex and subtle and the idea that somehow beatitude can only be love and doesn't somehow involve our intellectual capacities or the other way around, you can immediately appreciate why that might be, you know, even theologically problematic. And I use theological in a technical sense. Uh, but what we, you know, that what we have here, therefore, is a minefield. So Dante is a poem <laughs> that writes, it's a poem that tells, gives, offers an account of someone's, journey to God, which culminates in union with God. What's he going to choose, Dante? How's he going to resolve the contradictions that exist within the culture? How's he going to deal, you know, if he chooses A, then he's going to, you know, let's put it bluntly, he's going to piss off the people who believe B. If he chooses B, it's going to be the same thing. It's also going to, if he could compromise, the whole way in which his poem is read. And so he's facing a major problem. And it's a major problem that I won't be able to explain unless perhaps during the question and answer, if people write me, ask me the right question, I might be able in a couple of minutes, since I've now got six minutes left, <laughs> you know, to explain how this functions, what Dante tries to do. There's also, you know, a whole series of connected problems. What is it that the pilgrim actually sees? How does he actually see it at the end? And when does union with God, which is what beatitude is, actually occur in the Commedia? You will not believe how many different proposals have been made by Dante scholars. In my article, I actually list all the different lines and the different cant even where people suggest that this experience begins. And yet it's very clear where it happens. Again, why? In part it is because there is a general insensitivity to the religious dimension of Dante's poem and of Dante's culture. Because most scholars, they're like me, they're like I suspect most of you, we are lay intellectuals, we are secular, we don't... You know, but it, it shouldn't matter. We're dealing with text. It doesn't matter whether this fits in or not with our beliefs, etc. It's what the, t let's see what the texts are saying. It's not exactly rocket science. What's weird is why there should have been within Dante studies this denial or this, tre uh, you know, nobody, t to put it in very simple terms, nobody would think of treating Dante's relationship to Virgil in the very shoddy and haphazard and, 
slipshod manner that Dante's relationship to his religious culture has been dealt with. And that really no one sees a problem that we can't pin down, and yet in many ways it's very straightforward, you know, where it actually begins and ends. Dante is very, very careful. He talks, he uses this key verb in Canto, I think it's Canto 33 of Paradiso, appropriare, to approach. He's constantly stressing that he is approaching union with God. So it's at the moment when the approaching finishes, to put it in very crude and reductive terms, that that must be the point where the select, where union with God occurs. But remember, let's remember two things here. These are very important. He stresses throughout, and as we know, and it's a trope of all religious writing, is that the problem of ineffability, the problem of the limitations of memory and language. That we're dealing with something that in the end you can't talk about. So you're, you're kind of faced with attention. And one of the things that again has been very odd when you read the art, the studies that have been written on this question in Dante, is that people treat the union of God with the pilgrim as an event that actually happens in the text. When in fact all that Dante is talking about is the representation of that event. Because in any way if you think in the way in which people thought that it's something that you cannot talk about, you cannot remember, that what you're going to be dealing with is some sort of representation, some sort of vestigium trace of that event, of a sign which by its very nature is not that event. And in fact, things become a bit easier in trying to deal with the closing lines of the poem if we think of them as representation rather than as an actual realistic and in inverted commas, to put it very banally and crudely, account of that event. He's really dealing with different discourses around the question of the visio dei rather than with trying to give us an account of that event itself as experience, because it's an event he can't remember. And in the last few minutes that I have, let me, and there's a lot more to say, just let, if we look quickly and look at number, quotation six, which are the last ten lines, which in the end, scholars tend to say this is where Dante, you know, the union happens, even though they actually very often will have it starting much earlier. You know, th th there's a confusion there between the arrival in the Empyrean and actual union with God. The two are not the same. And that what we have in these last ten lines are the last moments of the approach. So, the first three lines, Tal era io a quella vista nova, veder voleva come si convenne, l'imago al ciel che come vi si indova, that is the third of the three theophanies. So he sees the volume of the universe, the whole complexity of creation and the interrelationship. He then has an insight into the Trinity. And both those two experiences within the theological literature of the time, certainly the first one was something that it was perceived one could arrive thanks to human reason. There were also those, as, you, as some of you may know, that believed, and Thomas is pushing in that direction, that one could understand the Trinity rationally. What you cannot understand rationally is the Incarnation, which is what lines 136 to 138 deal with. And Dante says, Ma non erano da ciò le proprie penne. That he couldn't understand it. He couldn't do it thanks to his own feathers. Now, it's interesting the metaphorical language that he's using here. It's clear that what he's trying to do by using this strange metaphor of incapable feathers is that he's trying to distance himself from the technical language of the scholastics. He's not saying there is a failure of the intellect here. That even Bonaventure in those quotation, in that quotation that I gave you earlier, you know, very clearly states. He says there's a failure of the intellect. And everybody would nod. You cannot understand according to medieval theological and I believe contemporary theological thought, the incarnation rationally. And he said, non c'è 
se non che la mia mente fu percorsa da un fulgore in che sua voglia venne. This is the moment when something else has happened. He is struck by this fulgore in which his desire, voglia, is satisfied. Now, so that's the moment of being overwhelmed by the divine. This is the moment when divine union occurs. So what would you expect to happen next is, would be, if we were telling an ordinary tale, just think of it as a, an ordinary novel, not an account of something that is fundamentally impossible to recount, for the reasons that I briefly adumbrated a moment ago, you would expect now to get a description of what union with God is actually like. And then you get this really weird line. All'alta fantasia qui manco possa. This is nonsense what he comes out with here. Why is it nonsense? Because it's completely tautological. It's out of order. It's, uh, it's irrational, it's illogical, because he says... And at this point, and that he, qui, we, you know, qui, I don't know what, let's just say, at this point here, this experience, etc., <coughs> lofty fantasy lost its power. Yeah, well, I, you don't have to tell me that, Dante. I already know that. And the reason I already know that is because in line 139 you tell me non era le proprie penne, that I couldn't intellectually understand this. How does it work? What is fantasy according to medieval physiology, psychology? Fantasy, so we get sense experience. That sense experience is filtered through to the intellect. Usually what we see is then filtered through to the intellect. What is it that does the filtering? Fantasia. So to say that all'alta fantasia qui manco possa, it's tautologous because we already know there's been an intellectual failure which had to be predicated precisely on the fact of what is said in line 142. What we have there, it, it's, it's very interesting what he does there. He deliberately distorts the logical order, distorts the way in which any... This is, pre, this is like medieval psychology 101 here. Everybody, you know, the, when he said... meant that fantasy had failed, meant what he tells us in line 142. So this is clearly, if I can see it, Dante saw it, so there's something very complex and deliberate. At the very point where one would have expected a description of the divine vision which he can't give. He introduces this useless line, this tautologous line. It's a kind of form of kind of very unique and original and personal apophatic rhetoric of saying, you know, apophatic rhetoric is of saying, you know, talking about the divine in terms of what it's not. This, he's offering a kind of sign, a completely inadequate, useless sign of that which he cannot talk about, because it is impossible to talk about. But he recognizes that this is where, if one could have talked about it, in terms of the kind of narrating that he's done throughout the poem, one would have had here a description of union with God. But he can't do it. And then what are the last three lines about? The last three lines about, they deal with the if not of the union with God, but of the effect of the union with God on him. And the means by which it was achieved, the union was achieved. So this union was a, a union that was achieved through love. L'amor che muove il sole e l'alte stelle, ma già volgeva il mio disio e il velle. And it was that what you've got at this point is that desire and will are in perfect harmony. Love has been the means by which union has been achieved and this has meant a unification of desire because our aspiration towards God is a desire which can only be satisfied in God. 
So what would seem to happen here is that Dante is very clearly suggesting that his experience in Via was an effective one. There is no reference to intellect. There is no technical language that belongs to the other tradition. But, and now I'm going to have to finish, is that really actually all he's talking about there is a corrupted memory of an experience in Via. This is not the, the whole theory of Beatitude. The, old the, the whole theory of Beatitude, the one that relates those in Patria in particular, is much more complex. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. very nice to have that fresh air because also, you know, we rinfescava le idee. I spoke for 45 minutes, I didn't do anything else. Questions? Go, my friend. Why did you choose this career? Why did I choose this career? There, there. <laughs> because I'm, I'm an extremely stupid person. <laughs> uh, how can I... I don't like talking about myself too much, but, you know, you've now put me on the spot. I, my parents were immigrants. My dad was a political emigre. I think like, your, like David's father, except David's father was Hungarian. My father was Polish, and he was an anti-communist, although he also had sort of, he was very pro-trade unions, he was a member of the union, he was active in the union. Uh, and he was also, he'd, he'd come from a very different background in Poland, but married into a, a working class, very pro-communist <coughs> family in Italy, who, my mum's family, and my grandfather was someone who actively resisted the fascists during the 20 years of fascism and ended up dying because he was tortured and ended up in prison and the kids his children my mom and my uncles they were all punished by being thrown out of school at the age of nine they weren't allowed an education it was part of the punishment both my parents though even though I come from a kind of working class background immigrant working class background they liked books so there were books around the house and, you know, in another life, you know, they were both smart people, my parents. Uh, and they had, amongst other books, they had everything. He must have been, he must have been the only, I suspect, Polish anti-communist who had the, what would they call the, the Pro Progress Press, Progress Publishers, Progress Publishers Marx, <laughs> Lenin, Engels at home. So I read you know that but I also read the Divine Comedy when I was about 14 15 you know I, I was you know the, the bright kid on the estate sort of thing you know so I would read I'd also go out and do things that we did you know play football and the other but I would read and I, w I was lucky enough there were selective schools at the time we went me and my brothers we went to very good schools which were full of working class mostly Irish some <laughs> Polish some other nationality kids in, in Manchester in the UK. And I read the Divine Comedy and I thought, shit, I haven't understood a word of this, <laughs> but it's effing brilliant. And I kind of thought, well, it might not, you could, I could do a lot worse in life than study this stuff. Now, would I recommend being an academic to anyone today? The answer is no, I don't. You know, I've, I've had a lot of, I would not do this career again. None of you know this, but right in the very far corner, now, right, everybody look at her in the far corner, that, <laughs> who's, she who is covering her face is my daughter, or our daughter, I should say, because there's a mother involved. As well. <laughs> our daughter, just by pure chance, is here on holiday with her partner in New York, and she's very kind, came here. And... I must say I was extremely grateful when Anna, at the end of her degree in Oxford in classics, decided to do something else and not be a, both Maggie and I breathed a sigh of relief because it's, you know, doing this job, 
people, it's remarkable how many of you want to study, want to learn, and it's great. It's brilliant. But there's, what sort of future? There were eight jobs in the United States, tenure-track positions in Italian for the whole of North America. There were two others that wanted French and Italian. There are programs that are producing 10 PhDs a year. Never mind, you know, it, it's a system in crisis. And this is a great tragedy because these things are interesting. They're fascinating. I feel very privileged. But David and I also, we were the lucky ones of our job because there weren't a lot of jobs when those of us who were in our, around our mid-60s, there were very few of us who got jobs. Then there was an expansion. Unfortunately, it's hard to see how there's going to be an expansion in the humanities and in particular in modern languages. And that's the truth. And I'm sorry to have to say that, and I consider it to be a major failure on my part that I wasn't able to better look after my subject and therefore make it something where you can feel that there is a future for people of your age and slightly older. So, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to invite you back now. You're putting off our time. <laughs> <laughs> we spend our time telling them there's hope in you know, the <laughs> Yeah, but there isn't. <laughs> yeah. but, but people still do it, which is great. But you have to accept that it could be a wonderful five, six, seven years of your life, but then you may end up having to do something else. Yes? Uh, you were saying that... Um, there was a lot of controversy and debate in, about um, Christian doctrine or, or religious culture, that it wasn't all cut and dried and uh, it was a very dynamic and lively and people weren't put in the dungeon if they didn't agree. And then you also said that um, the beatific vision itself is, a, you know, different ways of understanding what it is. Yeah. So I was wondering, given that that point you made would the same apply to what he says about hell yes yes and that, 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 that's a very good question there were compete there were competing views of what the afterlife was like uh, dante's vision dante's representation of hell in the first canticle is a strange amalgam of Christian and classical sources of learned and popular within this very loose term <laughs> notion of popular that I've been using. Uh, and so he, there was huge flexibility that basically what there was a recognition of that there was a place of punishment that if you didn't repent and therefore continue to offend God by your sinfulness is that you would be punished. One of the things that we should remember is that the doctrine of hell is only established after several centuries. It's not part of the early church. Uh, in, you know, and the whole notion of... The, there's very little within the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, about the nature of the afterlife. And that's why it's been such a... People have been so fascinated and it's been such a creative area of you know, Western culture, precisely because there's huge room to manoeuvre. Dante's representation of purgatory is hugely original. He actually transforms the geography of the world by locating purgatory on Mount Purgatory uh, in the Southern Hemisphere on an island and associating it with Eden. It's, it's a very, you know, there was... A huge amount of, you know, there's general notions around which there's agreement. Yes, there is the beatific vision. Or yes, there is hell. But then, as, you know, the, the, the phrase that Augustine used, Moses wrote it and then he went away. Which meant now it's up to us to fill in the spaces. Was, you know, was a standard view. There was a huge amount of... You know, give and take the wrong term, but there was a huge amount of room to manoeuvre for debate to go on. And as long as you didn't trans challenge the tenets of the faith, which is essentially the Nicene Creed, there aren't that many, you know, 
It's what we were taught in catechism. And if we didn't learn it right, you know, this is where charity came in. Sister Lawrence would come along and would smack you. This is a primary school, would smack you with a ruler. But not a, she. it's one thing getting whacked with a ruler like this on your hand. Sister Lawrence would get your hand on it and then would give the sharp edge and whack you. Woman was a sadist, you know. But you learned. No, you didn't. You, what, what, what? I'll tell you a story. I have a a brother who's a year and a half younger than me. Uh, he's called Marek. Marek or Mark. The Marek is Polish. But everybody, for reasons that nobody knows, what do they call him, Anna? Balek or Bol. And Bol was always a rebel from when he was young. And one day he'd had enough <laughs> of Sister Lawrence. So as she was going up the stairs, he trod on the back of her gown and it tore. <laughs> That was the revenge for the whole school. It was round the school within a matter of minutes. <laughs> and so my father got called in, as he regularly did on account of my brother. Because you know. probably the week before, he'd, you know, he was, uh, he'd beaten people up using a dustbin lid, and this was a nine-year-old. You know. Probably because some kids were bullying me, so he would come in and sort of... Yeah, <laughs> yeah so... I wanted to ask you about the, la the last ten lines. Um, you know this is really outside my field, but I was interested in this point that you're not dealing with a recollection of you know, representation of experience, but a kind of failed, or, you know, flawed memory yeah. of that which is not expressed. But doesn't that apply to the whole text? The whole of the, the Paradiso. Whole, well, the yeah. whole of the comedy surely is a recollection of a... You know, <coughs> it, that's a, it's a... It's a very good question, but... Essentially, the way in which it, it's, it's how, of course, memory is flawed by its very nature. But there's memory and memory. So the claim that Dante is making, and it works entirely, you know, within Aristotelian psychology, is that the first two realms, because he is giving, essentially, to use a modern term, a realistic account and that's entirely reasonable because there is no suggestion that there is there are moments where because of fear or some other emotion this is where the whole debate between the rational and the affective the emotions and reasons which I could have talked a lot about and again that's another area that needs a lot more work on because we've over intellectualized Dante we've over privileged reason and the first three <laughs> quotations, one is a privileging of reason, the other two are privileging of other forms of way in which we can deal, is that there's an acceptance that this is a reliable account because he is an eyewitness. All this VD, VD, VD that such a, or I was there is a way, and we can see this in terms of legal language, of the way in which eyewitness in chronicles, etc., he's historicizing the fact that, again, in the Bible, Moses, a lot of what Moses writes, or the others, it's an eyewitness account of what they're trying. So he places himself in that tradition of a reliable eyewitness. Mm. When it comes to paradise, because that's the, mo the point at which, the paradise of the third canticle, again there, he only really is directly involved with the divine in the last three or four canti when he arrives in the Empyrean because when he travels up through that's not paradise it's a symbolic representation of paradise when he's in the heaven of the moon that isn't paradise that's simply a symbolic representation of where those souls actually find themselves in the Empyrean the pilgrim is granted this extraordinary privilege you know God turns around to everyone in the Empyrean and say there's this Florentine guy I've chosen him to go on this journey through the afterlife. So all of you, bugger off, get out of paradise <laughs> and go down and inhabit the celestial spheres of the Ptolemaic universe so that he gets some understanding, a symbolic representation of what paradise is like. What the so really the union... With so as he's travelling up through the celestial spheres, his memory is very good. He still remember. he says it's more difficult to remember because you're closer to the divine, and so he plays on this. You know, he starts off by saying, I can't tell you anything. This he says it right at the beginning in the opening canto, but then he feels it's the longest of the canticles, he goes into more complexity than anywhere else, because 
precisely that. His encounter with the divine for most of Paradiso is a mediated one. It's the same one that we still have here on earth, according to Christian belief, whether it's the the universe, which for them was a book that could be interpreted, or reading the Bible, we have this mediated, you know, relationship with God through traces, through signs. So that continues. He uses that trope. So you then get to the Empyrean. Now the Empyrean itself is, I, I briefly, you know, hinted at this notion of an approach. He makes it very clear that as he gets closer to God, so he can remember less. So when he's on the, of course, there's a constant Pauline tra trauma, you know, like when Paul on the road to Damascus, etc., has a traumatic experience. But he continues to tell us it's only right at the very end. It's here, according in my interpretation, I may be entirely wrong, it's a hypothesis, that, you know, this is the moment when the full God comes, when the, you've got the final failure of the intellect. That's the point where he can't really remember anything at all. Prior to that, he's always able to remember, whether it's simply, I think I give you that quotation somewhere in there, like a dreamer who has a vague notion, but you're still remembering something. With the union with God, there's zilch, there's nothing. And the only way he can represent that nothingness, according to my interpretation of line 142, is to stick in something that's completely, the op you know, that really catches the eye, by the very fact that you wouldn't expect it there. So he's saying this is where, in line 142, I, if I only were able, I would give you a represent, I would give you an account of, of what the divine union is like, but I can't. So I'm just sticking this in, highlighting precisely the impossibility of even representing that indirect, you know, this is about as indirect a trace of that experience <laughs> as different a trace, as apophatic a trace, as you can possibly get. That's at least how I read just it. Just one yeah. other question yeah, of which, course. I, which I didn't get, which is, is line 142 in, in, internally Tautologus, or is it Tautologus because he's already said it in 139? He's already said it implicitly in 139. Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> there's no Tautology in the line itself? No, no, no. Sorry if I wasn't clear. Susanna. She's the expert in the no, field. No, no, I'm not, uh, not, especially not in the last, uh, the, the last lines of the Kant. I, uh, first of all, thank you. I really liked uh, the, the, all the things that you presented, and in particular the analysis of uh, the last lines. And I would like to understand it better. Um, the, uh, again, the same lines are here. The fantasia you mentioned before had a particular role in the uh, intellectual, um, and then therefore the memory, because it would create an image. Uh, the image uh, would be uh, the thing of upon, upon which, which the intellect would the work. The intellect yeah. would have to yeah. withdraw and therefore uh, form a memory. So, in that sense, uh, uh, might it be that is a different kind of failure, because the f this one is to visualize intellectually, to retain the image uh, through the work of fantasy. Why the veder voleva come si convenne. This is a moment uh, immediately after uh, he has actually see, uh, seen the circle with the image. That has already, that vision, yeah. the second of the vision of the incarnation has yeah. already occurred. Yeah. This is a second moment in which he wants to know why the reason it, it's this Absolutely. way yeah. and so it's another kind of failure because the vision the seeing has already occurred and it worked well so the fantasy was still working what is now working here is his capacity to give an explanation of Absolutely. the reason he wants so to in understand that understand sense the yeah, pin yeah. and the fantasy yeah. might be different but my qu question uh, and therefore may not be so tautological but my real question for you is another one, because uh, in my understanding of the beatific vision or the union with God, I always associated with an experience that would be uh, static in a way. Right? God does not move. That you know, is perfect, so he cannot do it. But here is all about uh, volgere. The very moment uh, when the, he, you know, the last uh, residual of intellectual capacity, this fantasy, it disappears. And the only thing that remains <coughs> is this union, apophatic, uh, I mean, according to them. But the, immediately after, I mean, uh, the, this is not 
uh, it, it could stop there, right? Uh, then we would imagine this union as the perfection yeah. and the mobility of yeah. somewhere. While that is turning, volge, how do you explain that? How, what is your take right. on that? No, let me deal with the first element. It is, he's trying to understand how the incarnation is possible, the union of the human and the divine. And that's where his intellect fails. And that's when the full God comes in. So to me, the, the, there cannot be anything after that. Once the full God's come, that's it. Issues to do with the working of fantasy, etc., are something that has already happened. You know, so that would be my answer. To deal with the other issue is a much more complex one, because it's to do with the way in which Dante actually talks about both the, this is lines 140 and 141, which is the moment of when he says this is when the union happens, when the full God strikes, mm -hmm. and then he talks about, as I said, its effect and the means through which it happened. Now, when it come, one of the things that, if I'd have had time, that I would have talked about is how Dante avoids, in general, the technical language of whether it's the affectivity people, the people or the, the, int, uh, the people who f place the emphasis on the intellect, there's a whole technical language, of which perhaps the most famous term is raptus. Hmm. Dante doesn't ever use the term. The only time he uses a verb from it is in order to talk about the effect of the song of some of the blessed lower down on him. So if he's avoiding this technical language, it's there for a reason. He's saying, you know, in a sense that he's, what he's trying to suggest is precisely that you can't really talk about these things. That if you kind of give a cultural currency to a certain technical language, you're kind of suggesting that this is what the experience is actually like. What he's saying is no, you know, this is something that we ultimately cannot talk about and we need to be aware of the limits of all language, even the most technical and most rigorous, in inverted commas, scientific language is itself a failure, is itself, if you want, a distraction, a distortion, even something that is, in inverted commas, dishonest, because it's not the real event, it's at most a vestige, as he says, a trace. And we're dealing with traces here which are being communicated through other traces, namely words. And this is, there's a whole game that's going on, a very serious game, but they're of the, way, the interrelation. So he's saying, this is what I remember. This is how I'm putting into work. Because my view, to put it in very crude and banal terms, is as valid as anyone else's. And he, what he, and it's like, where's the, he, he avoids the technical language whilst alluding to the ideas behind that technical language which essentially all involve the you know the role of the intellect and of affectivity of love in the process of union and one of the th and what he does so if we look at lines 140 141 which describe the moment when in my interpretation union happens if you go and you know, and look at the work of all the glossators, starting with the Tercento commentators, right up to people right to this day, including my own article, there are no, nobody has established any borrowings, any intertext for those lines. They're completely Dante's own. There may be a vague echo of a work which you almost certainly didn't know, which is, as, uh, Gregory the Great's commentary on Ezekiel. There may be a, a slight, but there isn't. This is him saying, these are my words. This is what I feel or what I can defectively remember. This is what it was, you know, that moment was like. And that's fascinating. In an author that is as elusive, as, as, as intertextually referential as Dante, to have two whole lines where we can't, connect it to the cultural discourse is remarkable. Now then, when we look at the last three lines, which are highly ambiguous, so Dante <laughs> is very, the whole of these ten lines, I could have done a whole, you know, I could have spoken all the time about their ambivalences and ambiguities and how that functions and how this relates, 
But Prithahi uses these ambiguities in order again to show the precariousness of what it is and the provisionality and really in the end, you know, the, value, the lack of value of what it is that he's representing because it, it, it's something that lies beyond what, he, what can actually, you can only experience it. What he's trying to say to people, it's almost the last plea at the end of the poem, lead a good life because if you really want to know what union with God is like, Lead the good, and you'll know it when you die, when you go up to paradise, etc. But the last three lines, Majabol Jeva, etc., they're full, as distinct from 140 and 141, they're full of intertexts. And, you know, and this is Dante scholarship has been establishing these since Pietro Alighieri, and a lot of work in recent years has been done to show what are quite explicit quotations in these lines. But there's one thing that unites all those references, all those references. Not one of them was ever used before Dante in relation to the Visio Dei. Again, underlining the uniqueness and the subjectivity, the non-canonical, the fact, again, of calling into question the traditional language i.e. the traditional forms of representation involving the way in which people talked about the, the beatific vision. Now these things in Dante, those of, we, you know, those of us who are Dante, we know that Dante is so obsessively deliberate in every word that he chooses, that these things are not arbitrary. These are part not using the technical language. Bringing in together, and this is what what I believe he's doing is trying to reconcile the two different traditions. That's essentially what he's trying to do. And because he, you know, he'll have in your, the final quotation, so you have Picarda saying union with God is effective, and then you have Peter Damien in Canto 21 saying it's intellectual. But in both of them, he'll bring in elements that recall the other tradition. So essentially, you know, what my conclusion is, is that what he's trying to say is, guys, it's not either or, it's both. But we people cannot understand the, the intimacy, so we oscillate, it goes from A to B, A to B, like this, trying to say, you know, to actually destabilize the way in which we think about these things in human terms, but trying to say, like, which is what line 142 is doing, it's illogical. It shouldn't, you know, it's causing crisis in us to make us aware of the fact that we're dealing with something that is so other, that it's not that I, Dante, am contradicting myself when I, when I have Picarda saying one thing and Peter Damien saying another thing. What I'm saying is that they're both, and that it's really, it's only we as human beings in our restricted way of thinking that cannot appreciate that this experience is one that is so, is so intimately involving the two. So there's a critique of the whole way in which the debate has gone implicit. And this is a, if you think this is a guy with no university training, with no sort of status other than that by the time he writes the Paradiso, he's generally recognized as the major intellectual in the peninsula, who's basically telling the theologians, you guys, you got it wrong. This, I'm talking about the, the scholastic theologians, the university professors. And one of the things that the work we've been doing on Dante's intellectual formation that's made us think about is how does Dante think about the university professors? That's another reason why he shouldn't be thinking of doing this profession. <laughs> is he doesn't like them. If Dante doesn't like us, I'm with Dante. <laughs> Thank you for this, for the talk, and for this wonderful moment of depression about my future career. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. But the question that I had is that one of the main tools at the time to actually stimulate the intellect and the effective faculties of viewers and readers were images. Yeah. If we look at the early reception of the Divine Comedy, yeah. we see that hell has a lot of images. While heaven, although we find some models, or some models uh, from other manuscripts, such as the Meditaciones Vita Christi, for example, the monumental paintings, does not receive the same attention. Yeah. So images are not used in Dante as much as Inferno or uh, 
as in fact, Purgatorio is also, artists are very shy of representing Purgatorio. Uh, I mean, in light of the culture they were trying to describe and the discussion they were having, I mean, what do you think illustrators were so shy or so, so intimidated? intimidated well, I in can't get into the heads of the you know, illustrators, but I can <coughs> sort of try to offer a cultural explanation. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I learned when I was doing research on the beatific vision is that there are no representations in the time of the beatific vision. Now, I, I haven't done this the research myself. I'm trusting art historians who've done this. So that already gives us a sense of how can you represent the divine. To me, it's, it's, it's actually that. The other does, let's also, you know, why are there more commentaries to the inferno than there are to the other two canticles or to the, you know, and that means, of course, the poem as a whole. In part, people start on something, they get enthralled by the, you know, it, the inferno is an adventure story. The, the whole poem is an adventure story, but it's, the drama is especially strong in the inferno, also in the Purgatorio. But they also don't have models for the Purgatorio that fit in with Dante's invention of the Purgatorio. You know, however, whatever, you know, the limitations of Le Goff's book on purgatory, and there are major, and he gets m m a lot of what he says about Dante in there is wrong. But he does clearly recognize the originality of Dante's view of purgatory. What an extraordinary... So if people don't have models against which the illustrators, a lot of these illustrators, one has to wonder how, you know, what level of education they may have had. You know, and therefore they, they may have been... So representations of hell are everywhere. Just think of the baptistry in Florence, etc. So they've got a visual memory. They've got a visual culture. But Dante's very challenging, you know just trying to read the Paradiso and trying to translate what he writes into images. You know, a, a lot of the time, even I've read, you know, some of these passages hundreds of times, I still have to go back and check the various notes to try to understand what is the guy actually saying. So there are, it, I'm, it, it may be a very pragmatic, pathetic answer, but sometimes, you know, pragmatism is not the worst thing in the world. You know. <laughs> You know, what's interesting is that in the early canon, we have somebody that attempted. So it's not that we don't have it. Like no, no, of course not. 943, somebody yeah. tried to find some models or some images that would suit. Yeah. Uh, uh, in particular, the affective dimension of the text. Yeah. But there is a dimension that, like, you know, Paradise didn't find yeah, yeah. a lot of followers, basically. Because also, how do you involve them, you know, with representation, visual representations of paradise effectively? You know, it's easy. You get the passion, you can really do with it. One of the interesting things is, is that given the importance of the passion within effective literature, why is Dante so reluctant to describe the passion? You know, and then you see how, again, he, you can contextualize that absence. Dante, although I have a student who has written a lot on blood and Dante and Paolo as well has worked on blood, etc. There's actually very little blood in the Commedia. Actual references to, you know, it's a most unbloody text, despite all those horrible tortures and sufferings. Go and actually map. This is very, you know, you can, one very banal way of explaining it, it's the opposite of the classical epic where blood is everywhere, especially once you get to Statius and Lucan. And he's very clearly doing a different type of model. Uh, don't you have a dinner reservation, <laughs> Anna and Tony? <laughs> what? Oh, have you? No. No, no, you'd better go then, and I'd better say goodbye to, to Anna and Tony. But they're coming to Chicago, where we live. In fact, we're on the same flight on Saturday, aren't we? We'll discuss it over there. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. You know, you don't want Anna and Tony to, miss, to not get their dinner at Palma. Yeah. <laughs>